Serious doctors have read it. What was the worst reaction? Happy, in a psychopathic way, or sad, that you have ever gotten from telling someone their loved one has slash will die. Nurse here. I work IQ so, when I have to phone someone to tell them their loved one's status has changed, or they have passed it's generally traumatic and unexpected, as compared to say a palliative unit where families know it's coming. I had a patient who was not intubated, rare in IQ, and just a genuinely nice guy. I talked to him most of my night shift about his family, life etc. I came back from my break at 3am and I hear my break relief partner yelling, get the crash cart. I had a bad feeling about this guy, so I kind of expected this, but obviously the family did not. Calling his son to say you need to pick up your mother and get here as soon as possible was hard enough. But calling him back to say I'm so sorry, but despite our best efforts your father did not make it was awful. This is a grown man. I heard his phone drop to the floor and he started sobbing to his wife and muttering incoherently between sobs. I didn't know if he was going to pick up the phone again, so I stayed on the line to listen for a little bit. Heartbreaking point edit. Thanks for all the kind words everyone. If your partner is a nurse give them an extra hug today. Because so many people are asking I'm Canadian. It's not super common for me as the nurse to call and tell family members their loved ones past. It is regular practice to give families updates. Our unit has a policy that one family member gets updates every shift or as needed, and since I had just called to tell the son his father was doing poorly it made sense for me to phone again as I was a familiar voice slash person to him. Backquote your 95 year old aunt is dying of lung cancer. There was a sudden emotional disproportionate amount of grief from her nephew whom from what I understood was not that attached to his aunt, he was also her closest living relation. It's just not fair. I pause and let him continue speaking, my CMT is frowning not really understanding where the conversation is now going. Bravely plowing on with the conversation my CMT continues the dialogue through its pre-planned route, it could be days or weeks she's currently got a very good appetite. Her nephew isn't really listening, he interjects, she chain smoked you know, funny isn't it how you can smoke 50 cigarettes a day and nothing happens, until you're almost 100. My wife never smoked. His voice trails off, my stomach does an uncomfortable twist, I look at my CMT who's looking at me like back quote what on earth, is he talking about? I don't blame her you know, she started smoking after husband died. She was one of the factory workers in WW2. She was so close to her husband. They never had any children. But I asked her not to smoke around my wife. Roy Castle you know, it killed him. Finally it's dawning on my CMT and myself. Sir, did your wife die of lung cancer? His eyes swell with tears and we are both trying to be as professional as possible. To not also start crying. It turned out the second hand smoke exposure had caused his wife. To pass away several years ago from lung cancer as they had allowed his aunt to live with them after his uncle passed away. His wife had never smoked in her life and we were totally unprepared for the raw angry grief he had so obviously pent up at his aunt for indirectly killing the love of his life. That I think was the most difficult breaking bad news I've ever had to do slash help to do. Mostly because it was completely unexpected and he was so raw, angry, inconsolable about his wife. Lesson learned. Smoking isn't worth it, and it's not just about you. Being blamed point this lady was visiting the area with her friends when she began having heavy vaginal bleeding. I told the patient that it is always concerning when a postmenopausal woman has bleeding. Furthermore, she had copious necrotic tumor falling out of her uterus as well. Point I told her that until the pathologist looks at it under the microscope we won't know for sure, but this is concerning for cancer. Long story short it takes days for the final read to come back, but she stabilized and went home in the meantime point unfortunately the pathology came back as a rare and aggressive form of cancer. I was no longer involved in her care, but was sorry to hear about the diagnosis. As a courtesy I called her to make sure she had all the information and had what she needed before going to see the gin oncologist. She tells me, oh I thought you were calling to apologize. I'll never forget you telling me that you think I have cancer, it's part of the stages of grief. 
denial, anger, etc. But still it hurt that I went out of my way to check in on her and she responded with so much anger and blame. True until we have a diagnosis we can't say if it is X or Y, which I told her, but we owe it to the patients when we have a serious concern that we have to share that info with them. Anything less is unethical. I don't want to say I've seen any which way someone can react, because I'll see one in a month or a year I never thought I would see point had a 60 plus y slash o man a few weeks ago come to the ed for abdominal pain and caught found a 10 centimeter mass in his pancreas. Always had a smile on his face. Joked with me while he was in the hospital. Thank myself and my resident team every time I was in the room or walked by and he called me in for our help. It's amazing how some people feel a sense of calm when you try to hold back your own emotions when telling someone they likely have seen their last Christmas or 6 to 7 family members in a room when grandpa slash dad was coding take different routes. One in the corner crying, one in the corner just staring at compressions, one trying to fight the chaplain, and one refusing to leave the bedside while screaming at dad to live. He didn't make it. As a resident in the IQ we had a 30 something mail code around 0500. Brought him back after about 30 minutes or so. Problem was he started to code after about 30 minutes. Compressions and another round of EP and he would come back just to do it all over again. With each code overhead the family would just stand up, walk outside and sit on chairs they brought outside the room. No emotion. No tears. Just had this look that he came back before and will again. My attending in-house was an old Air Force crit care doc and told the family after 5 cycles of this it was torture to continue. They disagreed. I signed out to the oncoming resident and heard they finally let him die around 1100 point in my state we have to wait 48 hours after deciding to withdraw care. After a few days, the patient's wife of 50 plus years decided to withdraw care. She couldn't help but feel she was killing her husband. He had a previous surgery to remove a lung and his one remaining lung had terrible pneumonia that wasn't improving. He went into touch and died 2 hours before we were to remove the tube. I have never seen a weight lifted off a family member like this since when she told me he knew I couldn't do it, so he did it himself. The one I will never forget is the withdrawal of care of a 17 year old. He was driving home from football practice with his little brother and flipped his car. He had it be and never regained consciousness. Brother didn't have a scratch. The dad was a mess but then thanked us for our care and respect after about 4 days. I will never forget the hatred and look the mom gave any medical staff in that room. I never heard her say one word. We were the team who couldn't and wouldn't save her son. She walked out when we brought up organ donation. My second branch as a resident was on a brain dead 17 year old, so we could see how good his lungs were for donation. The organ donation group sent me a letter a month later thanking me for my service. It stated the approximate age of each organ recipient, what organ they received, and what their hobbies are. I have that letter framed and hanging up in my house. EMT here. Had a few of these, but the worst was one I observed indirectly. We had a young woman in her 20s, killed instantly in a high speed collision. Same old story, car versus tree, the tree won. Girl was alone in the car, cold November night, sad way to die. The crash was so bad that we thought we should have the car towed back to the firehouse so the FD could do the extrication behind closed doors. We figured she'd just come apart when the car was pulled away from her. But she stayed together, mostly, and they loaded her into our ambulance. To go to the hospital to pronounce her, we were only basic EMTs and pronouncement wasn't in our protocols we get to the air and park up front, outside of the bays usually reserved for ambulances to back up into, no need to take up space with an already obviously dead patient. One of the air docs came out to the ambulance and pronounced her there and told us to sit tight, the family was coming. Apparently all they'd been told was that their daughter had been in an accident and that they needed to get to the hospital right away. So we sat in the ambulance with a dead girl under a sheet. She was only a few years older than me and I knew her vaguely from around town. It was weird point a pickup truck comes screaming into the air parking lot a few minutes later and a man and a woman about my parents age come tumbling out before it even stops and go running into the air. The parents 
A few minutes later the lights in the family waiting room, which is right across the sidewalk from our ambulance, come on, and a nurse brings the parents in. We can't hear anything, but we can see the exchange. Have a seat please. The doctor will be right with you. She leaves and closes the door, and we see the parents alone, terrified at what's to come. The mother is wringing her hands and pacing. The father is standing stiff and stoic. This is going to be bad. We can see the doc who pronounced her coming down the hall, with a nurse and a social worker in tow. He gets to the door, hesitates a second, straightens his tie, and turns to the women with him. We can't hear him, of course, but we knew he said, ready, he opens the door and the parents whip around. We see him introduce himself and give the short speech. I'm sorry to tell you this, but your daughter died at the scene of the accident. The mother melted. I've never seen a human just dissolve like that, like her bones had suddenly turned to jelly. The father caught her before she hit the floor, and he looked like he'd been hit with a sack of cement in the gut. He doubled over, but held on to her, got her to the couch, and we just sat there watching this horrible silent movie playing out in front of us. It felt shitty to intrude on their private moment, and we talked about it in the cab of the ambulance. In a way, we felt like part of that family, at least for the short time, that we took care of their daughter. We treated her body with as much respect as we could, we carefully transported her to the hospital so there would be no further damage, and we kept her safe while they were en route, and we made sure she was never alone point. That was nearly 40 years ago, and that girl has been dead twice, as long as she was alive. I think about her, and that night every once in a while, and now that I'm a father of kids about that age, it's too painful to bear. That was only one of hundreds of accidents I responded to over my Amazon firefighting career, and it wasn't even the worst one. But it was the one that had the most impact on me, and I often wonder how that poor family coped with it. Oh boy, this is one of my favorite stories. To tell my trainees TLDR I saw pretty much all the emotions and stages of grief in one 15 minute session point I was a second year resident in family medicine doing an IQ rotation in a pretty big city's downtown major hospital. One night we admitted a guy with sickle cell who developed acute chest syndrome and decompensated quickly. That night we worked to stabilize him and he held on okay. I told the family if his lungs hold up there's a chance he could do okay. I went home post call and came back to him in multi-system failure, lungs giving out with essentially nothing left to do. The attendings love to have us navy family med docs do the talk with families, we must have been good at it. Since I knew the family already they were ecstatic to have me back, and said you're up. I took a second year medicine resident with me to get a feel for the process, and the attending took us to the family room. To talk point there was about 20 to 30 family members there, all ages and types. The poor was his daughter who didn't know him too well, but was the closest relative as parents and wife had already passed. I started to tell them the news. That thing I had mentioned about the lungs holding out, well unfortunately they aren't anymore, and nothing else is either. The four medicines to keep his heart pumping won't work much longer, we need to talk about what to do. They said, pull the plug, and I said, yes, maybe. The handful of young girls that weren't the poor all started crying. One actually took off running and screaming down the hall. The men in their teens and twenties started swearing under their breath and congregated in the corner, staring daggers at me, and I'm sure planning on how to make sure the same thing happened to me as their family member. I'm guessing around then the other resident and attending sunk into the room, kind of like Homer through the shrub, because I was by myself for the rest of the event point I tried getting the daughter to make a decision, reasonably she couldn't. So she kicked me over to one of his cousins. The middle aged folk were arguing, each with their own opinion, and knowing everyone else was wrong. No one could agree, except that I was wrong, and I didn't know what I was talking about, and I lied to them the other night. They eventually punted to the next generation. His aunt was there with a few older folks sitting in a corner. She was far more reserved and realized the situation, and came to terms with it pretty quickly. She thought it was best not to let him suffer, so tried convincing the daughter to sign the paper. But the daughter couldn't bring herself to do it and started crying. After a few minutes more chatting, crying, and arguing another guy I had not seen yet started proselytizing. I just had a talk with brother Ben the other day about this exact thing. 
he knew he was in bad shape, and soon he would get to go back to Jesus. It was apparently the family's pastor, and he started preaching. With each sentence, another person joined this circle around me, the poet and the preacher until everyone was back. With each mention of Ben and Jesus, there was another Amen. Or Hallelujah, until everyone was yelling the joys of God. Finally, the daughter said yes let's do it to a resounding praise Jesus. We signed the papers. After about 15 minutes of all this, I found the other two docs in the corner, the other resident bug eyed and quiet. In the hall, the intensive care attending of over 12 years said well, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen, and I know he had seen a lot already. That IQ was crazy, and I have quite a few other stories from just a month there. Worked on a medical surgical for a few years at the beginning of my career as a nurse. Sure, we had a few patients here and there that were just there for observation point my first cancer patient I lost in my career seemed like one of those. When he was admitted to our floor, he was always cheerful, polite, and never admitted feeling ill in any way. One of the nicest people you could want to meet. I remember him because of this. Dude had stage 4 B lung cancer, and never once asked for anything point over the course of a few months, I got to know him better. As it turns out, he thought he had a bad cold, and found out he was dying shortly. It's cheaty, but that's life sometimes I suppose. It ain't always pretty. When he found out, he seemed at peace with it all. Then he began working like a madman from his bed. Every time I went into his room to check on him, or give him meds, he was writing in a notebook. Only once did he receive visits whole he was with us, and it was his wife, who was brought by a friend. She'd never learned to drive, because she never wanted or needed to. Dude spent his entire life taking care of her, completely and totally. As it turns out, all the writing in notebooks was him leaving her notes of how to do things. He'd literally taken care of her since they were in high school. She didn't even know how to use a dishwasher. Nothing point I think of him from time to time when I've had a rough go with love in my life. The times I asked this man about his wife were some of the few times I saw his face light up with delight. It's nice to think that love like that exists. Advanced care paramedic. So many stories, but here are a few. Major Oliver. Young female driver killed instantly. Young female passenger without a scratch. Extricating from the vehicle while it's being cut. Someone tells her that her friend didn't survive. She says oh, okay. Complete mental disconnection from the situation point stark contrast. 90 plus year old woman living at home. Found without vital signs in the hospital bed that she has in the living room. Very chronically ill lady with many medical issues. No advanced directives like a do not resuscitate order, so we work it. It's futile and this woman is very frail. We patch and get a pronouncement, which we told the family to expect, after full ACLS treatment and intubation. The family, one member in particular absolutely lose it yelling and screaming and crying so loud you can't hear yourself think. Major arguments break out with more yelling. People collapsing on the floor in theatrix. Police needed to intervene. Highest emotions I've ever seen in a situation that should have been largely expected point similar situation. Pronouncement of an elderly patient at home who didn't respond at all to treatment. Told the family, a daughter, who freaked and went into complete denial. Yelled at us that we were wrong and he wasn't dead. That she wanted him transported to hospital so they could work him. Telling us not to say foolish things. This after being prepped prior to us patching for a pronouncement point I've been part of a few pediatric death notifications, and every time there has been an absolutely ear-piercing primal scream from the mother of the deceased. Many others have noted this instinct as well on other cases. Not exactly death notification, but told a family that the father was having a major heart attack and we were going to rush him straight to angioplasty, cardiac surgery. Quite serious situation with a relatively high risk of death or complications. Teenage daughter didn't even glance up from her cell phone to say bye to her dad. Nearly broke my heart because I have a young daughter at home and would have been devastated if she treated me in that manner. Edit. To add a bit of context to the last story. Kind of a spin-off on this topic. It upset me because one of the worst parts of medicine is when we don't get the opportunity to notify family slash patient that the situation is dire and they don't have even a bit of time 
To anticipate the death point example, we picked up a middle-aged gentleman with some neurological symptoms, confusion, maybe some weakness. We tell the family to meet us at the hospital and that it was a possible stroke. Not super urgent, but we had the stroke team notified and took it seriously. Then en route he seizes, requiring sedation and intubation. Turns out it was a major brain bleed, hemorrhagic stroke, which can present similar to a regular occlusive stroke. He would never wake from the sedation slash intubation prior to his death. Then I had to break it to the family at the hospital that things went sideways. I wish they would have known, before we left, that it would have been the last conversation they had with him. Hence why I like preparing families and appreciate when they take us seriously. I'm a TV news photographer. The stuff you see on the TV news, I shoot and edit that video point 20 years ago, about an hour outside of Macon, Georgia, deep south. Four high school boys were in a car traveling 60, 70 miles per hour, about the speed limit for that road, slightly over, on a rural state highway. There is a four-way stop coming up. When you are a 17-year-old boy these four ways are a huge bummer because you have to come to a complete stop and then accelerate to 70 miles per hour again. It is late at night, midnight, and it is not uncommon for young dumb boys to ghost the intersection or, on approach, flip off your headlights and fly through at speed. This is an intersection that sees maybe 3 to 4 cars an hour at that time of day, and it takes 0.5 seconds for you to fly through. It is stupid, but not particularly dangerous on this particular occasion a woman and her mother were on their way home, and entered the intersection, just as these boys ghosted it. The car that the women were in was completely bisected. The four boys and the two women were all killed. Point these four boys went to a high school that had maybe 30 to 40 people in it. School was cancelled for a few days, and on the day before school was about to resume, the kids from these boys' class, which has been decimated, it was a class of maybe 10 to 15, and they lost a third of their class in this event, had a little memorial at the intersection. It was run by the kids and there were no adults present, but they'd alerted the media there, so it was just me and them. They directed four white crosses out of wood and pounded them into the roadside with rocks the kids, as kids in that situation are, are kinda awkward. They drive the crosses in and nobody really knows what to say. When the last one is set, everybody kinda looks at one another and we have a moment together. Then, the most redneck of the group, in a quiet thoughtful somber tone, says 8, who's got the kerosene and a lighter, point the group looks at him in horror. Time stops, then simultaneously we all bust up laughing, and the harder they laugh, the more they cry. It is one of the most memorable moments of my life, and it was exactly the right thing to say at that moment. In turn year of residency, while working on the vascular surgery service, her page is about an older lady who was being transferred in from an outside hospital with an aortic aneurysm rupture. Point aortic aneurysm ruptures have a really poor outcome, but the interesting thing is that, while an individual is actively dying from it, they are still coherent and not in, relatively, terrible pain. About a couple minutes of me leaving the air room, the patient died. Anyways the daughter and best friend arrived, presumably being with her at the other facilities her previously. I took them to a separate room away from all the hustle of the air and let them know. Of course they were surprised, because we were just talking to her, and she didn't seem to be in that much pain. Both of which are true statements, aortic aneurysm ruptures really are a relatively low pain way to die, but can be pretty shocking for the loved ones to register in a short amount of time. Alternatively it was the 40 something year old mother of two who had been admitted for nausea and vomiting and died of multisystem organ failure, heart attacks, strokes, ischemic colitis, pulmonary embolism, ECT, because of a rare clotting disorder then decided to manifest itself all at once for the first time in her. Telling the family that someone that young and previously healthy that not only is the mother going to die, but that they should have their doctor look at screening them for a rare condition is no fun. This will be buried, but in another life I was a, transporting, EMT. We got called to confirm a death in a residence. When we got there we were told to go to a dimly lit room, where an older man was on floor. A bit cyanotic but still warm, and no lividity or rigor. 
so we started to set up for CPR and began throwing patches on him when the family started shouting at us, you're not bringing back paps. Then we noticed that the four family members shouting were also holding guns. Soon other family members began arriving at the house. They were also concerned about us working on paps and every single one also came in holding a gun. And every time someone would come and they would yell to them, they is trying to make paps alive again. In a short amount of time there was about 15 or so rednecks all angry, carrying shotguns and rifles. My partner and I decided to leave and wait in the ambulance until the police arrived. While we were waiting two more pickup trucks showed up with a few more family members with guns. I guess the police knew the family well. The backstory was Paps was going to be admitted to hospice next week for a terminal condition, which nobody could be bothered to explain to us. The most faked up one though had to be my weirdest family. Mind you I have seen hundreds of people die in my job, but anyway, my grandmother died while in hospice and had donated her body to science, as in to be cut up my MD students. My mother and uncle wrote on her with the sharpie things, like cut here and dotted lines, so that the med students would laugh when they got her body. I work as a part time firefighter slash paramedic point anyways it was a beautiful summer day. The kind of day where it's just a perfect temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Not too cold, not too hot. The kind of temperature you'd want it to be every day. We were called out for a possible suicide slash wellness check. We arrived to the home that was located on a beautiful lake. I go in through the open front glass wind door. Inside I see two friendly big dogs running around confused. Walking in through the home I see multiple stacks of divorce papers piled a couple feet up in the air on the kitchen table. I look through the beautiful patio doors to see a six foot ladder with some rope and random tools placed near it, all in front of the beautiful lake view. I make my way to the basement and start walking down the stairs to find a dead man, around 40s, lying at the bottom. It looked like he hung himself somewhere on top and the rope ended up breaking from the weight hours after. We run a mandatory cardiac strip and mark the time of death. I walk up the stairs to hear my left tenant speaking with apparently the brother of the dead man. What the fuck did you do, guy's name? He repeated that phrase numerous times while starting to break down cry. The dogs were still walking around confused no idea what is going on. It was my first suicide call I went to. My lieutenant patted me on the back and asked if I'm good. I'm good I answered. <laughs> Cardiology fellow here. I think the worst time was talking to the wife of a 40 year old guy who had died from the repercussions of a massive ST elevation me. He had a heart attack and came in with a really delayed presentation. 24 hours. Took him to the cath lab and fixed the blockage, but he had a residual cardiac ejection fraction of about 10%, normal is 60%, course was going okay for the next 48 hours. Or so, he had a balloon pump, a type of advanced circulatory support. Coming out of the lab which was pulled out successfully, and things were going fairly well. But, as is the case with these kind of things, things went wrong quickly. He went into VT storm with rapid degeneration to VF, an ahythmia not compatible with life, and was very refractory to shock slash and diahythmics. We tried to cannel it for ReCMO, another type of advanced circulatory support, sort of like an external heart, but he ultimately just didn't make it. Telling his wife was terrible, mostly because he was doing so well, then decompensated so rapidly. She just collapsed, and I had to catch her before she fell down. She was in the middle of the CCU, and we had to lift her up and move her into a waiting room, where she just laid and cried and screamed for at least an hour. It was heartbreaking point edit. Sorry guys I used some technical terms here that I'll try to clarify. Street elevation me equals a heart attack, where there is a 100% blockage of a coronary artery. Street elevation refers to what we see on an EKG during this event. These are generally the most dangerous types of heart attacks, because a 100% blockage means no blood flow to whatever territory they are supplying. In this case, the patient had a 100% blockage of the left anterior descending artery, which supplies the bulk of the anterior and septal portions of the heart, which is a very large territory. Ejection fraction is the percentage of blood that gets pumped out of the heart per beat. A normal F is about 60%. 
That means that 60% of the blood in the heart prior to a contraction is pumped out per beat. So, for example, if there is 100 milliliters of blood in the heart before a beat, with an F of 60%, that means that 60 milliliters will be pumped out. In a person with an F of 10%, that would just be 10 milliliters. An intraortic balloon pump is a type of mechanical circulatory support which can be placed within the aorta during a cardiac catheterization procedure. The details of why it helps are quite difficult to explain even to many people in the medical field, so let's just leave it at this. It increases the ability of the heart to pump blood forward, and it increases the amount of blood that enters the coronary arteries, thus, the amount of blood and oxygen that the heart itself receives. VT equals ventricular tachycardia. VF equals ventricular fibrillation. When there is a complete lack of blood flow to part of the heart, as in in street elevation me, with delayed presentation before intervention, heart muscle dies. Dead heart muscle leads to a lot of immediate complications, one of which is electrical instability. That dead heart muscle is an for abnormal heart rhythms, such as VT and VF. These cause your heart to beat rapidly and erratically. VT is many times not compatible with life, and VF is never compatible with life. To treat these events, we defibrillate, and we give medications known as antiarrhythmic CCMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, is another type of mechanical circulatory support. It too is quite complicated to explain. In this case, we would do VAT ECMO, or venous arterial ECMO. Essentially, the goal is to take blood out a large vein of the body, run it through an oxygenator, and pump it back into a large artery. Thus, we take over two functions, blood oxygenation, and blood pumping ability CCU equals coronary care unit. It is an intensive care unit for cardiac patients hope that provides some clarification. I'm a second year hematology slash oncology fellow, doctor who has completed residency in internal medicine, and completing training to become an independent hematologist slash oncologist, as a preface, we deliver bad news a lot to our patients, unfortunately. Whenever asked how my day was, I usually say something to the effect of great. I only made two people cry today. The most memorable one that happened recently. A 20-something year old Muslim man with a very treatable slash possibly curable lymphoma. We did all the work up to start chemotherapy, and he was set to start, after I thoroughly explained everything to him, and gave him handouts about the treatment and such. He was always alone, but I knew he had a huge family, so I told him he should have one of his family members there to help him. Reportedly 15 siblings, his mother, and a stepmother mom shows up, and patient asks me to come to room. Turns out he didn't tell her anything about why he was in hospital. So I start to explain things, and as soon as I say lymphoma, a blood slash bone marrow cancer. The mother starts shaking then gets up from chair, goes to trash can, and vomits several times then paces around the room the rest of the time we are talking point to make things better patient leaves prior to starting chemo to go back for alternative treatments with antioxidants despite warnings that this will kill him if he doesn't start treatment soon. I don't know what happened to him. I posted this before, but the memory sticks well with me. Both the husband and the father were told simultaneously and their reactions, though both grieving, were very different. The news that the patient, 24 years old, died was very surprising and unexpected for them. The husband wailed openly for about a minute. The father was far more contained and rational about it, discussing immediately the multiple mismanagements of patient care that had occurred. Here is my old post for context, this occurred when I was a senior OBGYN resident point another hospital had just done a 24 year old's third c-section, good friday afternoon, and had encountered a placenta accreta, placenta grows into the muscle wall, that they thought they were able to control without a c-hysterectomy, a few hours later she began hemorrhaging, and they then took her back, and did a hist, but she was bleeding so quickly the hospital began running out of blood. They had to transfer the patient to us on a 40 minute ambulance ride point I thought we could save her, so long as she didn't arrest, and we were able to get her enough blood products. We met her at the ambulance bay with rapid infusers and the full or team scrubbed, and ready to take her back to surgery. She eventually received 30 units of blood from 30 different individuals. 
Me and three other doctors worked furiously to stop all her bleeding, but she had entered full blown dick. Your blood no longer has any clotting factors and all surfaces begin bleeding spontaneously. And she began bleeding into her lungs and went into hypoxic arrest. What hit me hardest is that I really didn't expect her to die until I began hearing the OTOSAT monitor begin beeping at lower and lower tones and I saw it in the 60s. I will never forget the deep groaning sensation you get in your belly when you know the patient you are working on is going to die. Point the PT's father and her so did not expect it either. I had never heard a man wail until my attending and I came to tell them that their loved one had passed. I'm not religious, but I was so thankful that our hospital had an on-call chaplain, which helped me process the situation. I actually started my week vacation a few hours later, which may seem like bad timing, but helped me get over the tragedy point the other hospital suffered a huge lawsuit from this because of multiple lapses of care. I know that the doctor there sought psychiatric care afterwards for depression and suicidation. I have been browsing reddit for a few years now. Decided to make an account because of this question. I'm an internal medicine resident and in my program we essentially run the IQ when we are on the rotation. I was carrying the pager during a 28 hour shift when we were called to a code blue. I ran over to find a young man whose heart had stopped beating. In such situations, we typically usher the family out of the room, but in this particular situation, the young man's mom would not leave. She was threatening to punch people that came close to her. It wasn't too big of an issue for me that she stayed in until she started screaming at me to save her son's life. We stabilized him, got him to our IQ, and the patient coded again. We spent about 3 hours at his bedside doing compressions, placing central lines for blood fourth medications, and looking at his airway slash lungs with a bronchoscope, fancy word for airway camera, and the entire time, his mother continued yelling at us to do more. There was nothing more we could do, I essentially sat down on the floor in his room, after we were done out of pure physical exhaustion. When I left the room, I ran into the patient's aunt, mom's sister, in the hallway. She apologized for the way the mom was screaming throughout the code and thanked me for doing everything we could. Needless to say, I had never slash have never encountered a situation like that. When I think about that day, I still sometimes hear her screaming. I realized that the physical exhaustion wasn't as bad as the mental and emotional exhaustion I experienced. My husband is not a doctor, but is a retired state trooper. A few years ago he had to do a death notification. To let this man know his fiancée had died in a wreck. When he delivered the news, the man shrugged and said that's alright. She wasn't anything but a damn beach anyway. Another memorable one was when a 16 year old boy, we'll call him Josh, died after swerving off the road at a high rate of speed. My husband went to Josh's house to let his parents know and when they came to the door, their other son, we'll call him Michael, accompanied them. Michael was 8 years old and autistic. Sorry if that's not politically correct, I don't know what is anymore. When my husband delivered the bad news, Michael started jumping up and down with excitement and repeating does this mean I get to have Josh's room now? Does it? Can I have his room now? Josh isn't coming home, he's dead. Can I have his room? I want Josh's room. My husband said it was heartbreaking to see the parents have to take in the loss of one son while the other son doesn't quite understand death. And was excitedly repeating over and over again that he wanted Josh's room point edited to add one more. The last one that really stands out to me is when he had to do a death notification to a woman who was a flight attendant. She had just gotten married a few months prior and her husband died in a car accident while she was at work and in the air. My husband called the airline she worked for to find out where she was and it turned out her plane was about to land back at the airport in our city. My husband and another trooper headed to the airport to await her landing. When she touched ground, she was ushered to an empty room in the airport where my husband and the other trooper were waiting for her. When they broke the news of her husband's death she just stared at them in silence with no expression for about 10 seconds and then eventually said he died not knowing I love him. Turns out, before she left to go to work that morning, they got into an argument. When she went to leave the house, he stopped her and told her he loved her. She just looked at him and then slammed the door and left. He died before she got the chance 
to tell him she loved him back. This one breaks my heart the most and is why I never go to sleep or leave the house angry or without telling my husband I love him. I'm a medical student from India. There have been so many cases of assault on doctors in my country lately. It's like the mindset of people about doctors has undergone a huge change lately. People think of them as these evil and corrupt beings who only want to make money. It is a really sad state since most of the people enter this profession with the sole intention of saving lives or making them better. There have been so many cases where doctors have been brutally beaten up when they inform the relatives about death of the patient. An 80 year old chronic alcoholic died of liver failure and the relatives beat up the treating gastroenterologist who himself ended up in a hospital with several stitches and broken bones. Another doctor in Pune died as a result of such an assault. A female gynecologist was manhandled and threatened with sexual harassment. So many cases every month, the resident doctors go on strike, but the truth is that nothing substantial will happen until people understand that we really do try our best to save patients. The medical college where I did my undergrad actually has bouncers now. Point there are so many articles about increasing violence against doctors in India in many of the leading medical journals. This country really isn't a good place to be a doctor. Right as I'm walking in to start a 7am shift in the IQ, code blue. This was a middle aged man who was in a very bad way from multiple medical comorbidities, a lot of them alcohol slash substance related. While his code wasn't necessarily expected, it certainly wasn't surprising either a code blue at any time is an exhausting and demanding event for medical staff. But as you walk in the door it certainly sucks, the caffeine hasn't even hit you yet. But the entire code team was there, and we did the whole resuscitation thing. After the 20 minute mark of chest compressions and breathing with nothing but a flat line, the intensivist leading the code agreed with a colleague that it was time to call it. If you've ever seen a code like this, they aren't pretty. Chest compressions are violent. They break the ribs. We had worn out a long line of nurses, EMTs, and medical students, myself included, doing the compressions. This man's rib cage was flattened and deformed. If we had succeeded in reviving him, he would have been in a world of hurt and would not have survived the sequelae of the trauma of CPR for very long. Of course, on TV you never see these gruesome realities of resuscitation. The patient wakes up, hugs their family, thanks the doctors, it's a beautiful moment. But in reality, well there's a reason that every medical professional I know past middle age says they are DNR. But I digress. This man was as dead as could be after all of this brutalizing effort. The doctor really didn't want to call it without the family there. They should be consulted, right? Of course the wife is being paged overhead throughout the hospital. And nursing staff is calling her cell phone point. Finally she bursts into the IQ, screaming and crying. It's 7.30 am. She's drunk as could be. She reeks of booze. She's screaming and crying. The lead intensivist tries to explain to her what has happened, and there is no hope, and we would recommend ceasing the assault on this lifeless corpse. Meanwhile resuscitation efforts continue point after a while it's obvious that she is three sheets to the wind and cannot be reasoned with, we have to call a code, and a considerable amount of staff then dedicated themselves to console and calm. This woman who had thrown herself onto the lifeless body of her husband and was screaming at us to please continue, do not stop, her cries filling the entire IQ. It really was heartbreaking. Please don't read my words as being judgment of her, only the heavens know what was in that woman's aching soul that day. I had to stifle my own tears watching her loud torment point morning rounds were quite subdued and somber that day. As a surgeon I have a few stories of life and death. There are a few times I've had to give bad news. Most of them are to the family of a 60 to 70 or 80 year old about a cancer diagnosis. This is bad, but I try to always keep the hopes up, even if that hope is less than a 5%. The worst cases have been a 16 year old girl with gastric cancer, with peritoneal metastasis. These gave her intestinal obstructions, and long story short she had to spend her last weeks in the hospital. Met all her family and friends. I had stomach pain every morning during rounds with her story. The day she died I felt relieved, but it was one of the worst things I've ever experienced. I had a daughter a few years later, and recalling that story makes me wanna cry thinking it could happen to me. 
I had a similar patient 21 year old boy with a metastatic osteosarcoma. His family with a friend from med school and he told me they had given up after founding lung metastasis in another clinic. I set them up with a lung surgeon and they went for the surgery. Everything was great but last week he returned with a relapse and this time there is no chance of surgery. Cancer is really a beach. On the bright side, had a patient with gastric cancer who had a complication after surgery. He was 60 year old and really good prognosis after surgery. Big family. The complication sent him to the IQ and he spent 2 months in there. I had to see him and change his dressings every day sometimes twice a day point I always blamed myself for his failed surgery. I had zero faith in his recovery and more than once spoke to the family of the eventual death in the next hours. Still he endured and I see him today 6 point months later and has like a new man. The family is awesome and they thank me every time they see me and I just feel like crying cause has like a walking miracle and I'm probably point more grateful to him than he is to me. Not sad, definitely not happy, but very upsetting, a traffic accident severely injured two young kids, both daughters of the same mother. The older child, 11, demised shortly after arrival and second one, 4, was in a stable but critical condition. We stabilized the second kid at a rural hospital, so we arranged for her to go to the closest pediatric trauma center. 400 kilometers by road. IMSS authority considered her stable enough to travel by road. The mom and dad arrive uninjured, but obviously distraught. In comes the children's paternal uncle and demands that the child be transferred 900 kms away, closer to their hometown, because the mom had to be present for funeral arrangements. We pleaded to have the kid go the shortest route to minimize time spent in the ambulance because transfer is an extremely vulnerable period in a medically critical condition as things can suddenly go wrong and then interventions are severely limited. No matter how much we pleaded with the uncle, he remained obstinate, the funeral took preference over the surviving child's safety. We appealed desperately to the parents, but they appeared submissive to the uncle's judgment, presumably it's a patriarchal cultural thing. It was the end of my worst shift ever, and for some reason I can't remember the ultimate outcome. Point DL. Doctor traffic accident, one child died, second child critically injured. Uncle demands surviving child be transferred twice as far away, closer to home, because funeral arrangements were more important. Had a Jehovah's Witness patient. About 40, had a severe GI bleed due to overuse of NSAIDs his blood counts kept falling, even after we slowed the bleed down a lot. We got a reticular site count, test that shows brand new blood cell percent, and it was zero. Guy had a plastic anemia, without a transfusion, and further later treatment including possible bone marrow transplant, he was going to die in the next 24 to 72 hours. I informed him of this, and urged him to reconsider. Laying in the bed with his wife and kids bedside he told me, if God wants me to die then I will die, and his wife and children smiled, and totally accepted this all as the will of the Lord. Point every day, when I made rounds I urged him to reconsider. The day before the last day I told him, that he would soon lose consciousness, and if that happens I have to follow his directive, and not treat his anemia. He again refused treatment. Next day he went unconscious, 12 hours later he died. Wife and kids were serene as could be as daddy was going to heaven point I'm super hardcore science minded. I found this one really hard to swallow. I could have saved that guy easily if someone hadn't indoctrinated him to believe what he did. Was really hard on our whole team to just watch an otherwise healthy young guy die. I'm a vet. Had some bad ones. The worst was a disabled veteran who brought her service dog in when it had a GDV, a twisted stomach. The dog looked pretty rough and the blood work was ugly I warned her this could go poorly, but that we would do everything we could. Took the dog to surgery, and almost the entire stomach was black and dead. I was trying to figure out if there was any way to salvage things when the dog arrested. We started CPR, and I ran back up to talk to the owner. She did not take it well. I explained what was going on, and that we were doing CPR, but that based on what I was seeing in the abdomen I thought it would be kinda for the dog to let him go. She started screaming, just screaming with grief, then yelling that he could not die, he could not be dead. She would not consent to stop CPR, 
so we spent 30 minutes doing chest compressions on a dead dog before I could finally convince her we needed to stop. She had a friend with her and I was ready to strangle the friend because she kept saying things like why didn't we bring him in sooner? We should have brought him in this morning. Like, that's really not what this owner wants to hear right now, lady. Finally the screaming died down, but then she started talking about how she wanted to die, that she was going to go home and shoot herself in the head. I finally convinced her to call the therapist she'd been working with for her PTSD, and that seemed to help. They were able to calm her down. Remains one of the worst cases I've had. I felt so bad for that lady. Two stories immediately come to mind. Point one was a man who was very elderly, in his 90s. He was very weak and frail, with multiple comorbidities. He was dying from sepsis that overwhelmed him quickly. His children elected for comfort measures only, and we made him comfortable, setting up a morphine drip to stave off any pain. They brought his wife in to be with him. They lived together in a nursing home, sharing the same room, and they even had their beds pushed together. The man didn't stay long after the drip was started and passed peacefully surrounded by family. But I will never ever forget the look on his wife's face at bedside just as he passed. Her frail little body just racked by sobs and her face so twisted in pain that even the charge nurse that day, who is very stoic by nature, went and shut herself in her office and just wept. We all did. The second was not so peaceful. A woman in her mid-fifties was on my unit. She was riddled with cancer, which had started in her breast and metastasized to her liver and spine. She was deathly thin and severely jaundiced. She was in so much pain that she was still uncomfortable despite throwing everything we had at her. The doctor came in to talk to her and her family about making her comfortable as there were no more options to pursue for her cancer and that she is actively dying. The patient was in so much pain and on so many meds that she wasn't present enough to comprehend, much less decide. So the patient's adult daughter was next in line to call the shots the vast majority of families in these situations are emotional, but understanding and accepting. They do not want their loved one to suffer. The daughter's response was the exact opposite. Her directions in response were to discontinue all of her mother's pain medications because they made her sleepy and they couldn't visit with her when she was so out of it. She also stated that her mom was to remain a full code with all efforts and means being pursued to resuscitate her should she go into arrest. The doctor was dumbfounded and asked her if she really understood the depth and gravity of her mother's situation. She replied she did and that she would not give up on the possibility of a miracle. Bound by the power of attorney's wishes, we stopped this poor woman's pain meds but immediately consulted the ethics committee. Bureaucracy is insanely slow, though, and lord, did this woman suffer. Her screams were inhuman. The doctor tried to talk to the daughter, but she wasn't having any of it. A bed finally came open on the oncology unit, which is so much better for these situations. So we transferred her up to that unit. Even on powerful narcotics, the poor woman screamed, like we were stabbing her, when the bed went over any bumps or door jams. Finally, the daughter flipped. Watching her mother suffer broke through the denial, and she restored her pain meds and made her a DNR. The patient died a couple days later. The whole situation still makes me seeth, despite the daughter's change of course point not a doctor, just a nursing assistant. It's amazing how many family members will have strong medical reactions to receiving bad news. I've had to send quite a few family members straight from their loved one's room to the emergency room when they passed out and hit their head or developed severe chest pain or something similar. I try to give a lot of leeway because you feel incredibly guilty separating someone from their family member who just died, but some people have legit really bad medical things happen because of the stress and they themselves definitely need medical care. As for the worst case, the worst was a younger guy, 30s 40s, who died from cancer. He was super nice and had a really great family with whom I interacted quite a bit in his last few weeks. His mother was always around and was really nice to talk to despite how sad she was about the whole thing. He had widespread metastases and dwindled until his final hospitalization when it was pretty obvious there was no fight left. He got more and more tired and needed more and more pain medications and he just wasn't strong enough to survive any more chemo. 
he went on to hospice and asked to go home to die peacefully. As part of this, his code status was changed to do not resuscitate so that he wouldn't get any futile CPR while still in the hospital. We were setting up all the necessary equipment at his home so that he could leave the next day. I'm off in another part of the hospital when I hear a code blue called on the intercom. I'm not on call or anywhere close, so I ignore it, but I do mentally note that it's on my patient's floor. A minute later, the intercom comes back on and specifically calls for me to go to that room. So I run over there, and the patient has died, except he's getting CPR. His heart stopped, and a nurse at his bedside asked the patient's younger brother, the only other person in the room, what he wanted to do. In a panic the younger brother yelled save him, so the nurse called the code and started CPR. When I arrived, some family members had gathered outside the room. The code team didn't need my help, so I started talking to his family. It felt like it took an eternity, but eventually I convinced them to agree to stopping the CPR and to honor his wishes. I stopped the code, pronounced him dead, and helped to clean him up. When the family came in, his mother gave me a big hug. She didn't say anything other than my boy, my boy, my boy. She kept saying that over and over. I could hear down the entire length of the hall as I walked away. I remember in medical school I thought that getting your name called on the overhead pager during an emergency was really cool, but after that afternoon, I hate it. Anesthesiologist here the time I remember the most was really heartbreaking point we had taken an older man into the operating room for a quick look laparoscopy. You basically insert a small camera into the peritoneal cavity, the abdomen, and look around, and the bowels and the liver and so on. This gentleman had bad heart disease and had survived multiple surgeries and procedures. He had probably been in the hospital for a month or more. We suspected ischemic bowel, essentially a lack of blood flow to part of the intestines. If it's a small part you can cut out that part and put things back together. That's what we were hoping for. When we inserted the trocker and the laparoscope, we found the whole bowel was dead. It had suffered a major lack of blood flow to the point it was unrecoverable. The only way to fix this would be to cut out his entire bowel, a big and risky operation. Even if he survived all this, which is unlikely, he would have had to live the remainder of his days without being able to eat at all, and those days would be painful and be in the hospital point anyway the surgeon asked me to come with him to talk to the family. I left an assistant in the operating room. His two sons were in their 20s. One of the sons was a medical student. When we told them the situation, their faces fell. Tearfully they asked us if it were true, if there was anything else we could do. We were fully honest, telling them that on our experience any further treatment would only prolong suffering and their dad would never leave this hospital anyway. Point as a physician, the job can be tough in a technical and physical way when doing hard cases, working long hours, but nothing prepares you to deliver this kind of news and making these decisions. These families and patients stay with you. It is critical, however, to have these conversations both for the family and your own empathy and humanity. I'm no doctor, but I have a story that would fit in here. Point my grandmother was married several times. Her first two husbands killed themselves. The third was an alcoholic, physically and mentally abusive, a liar and a cheat point. When the third died we had the funeral slash wake. We sat and listened to his final wishes after everyone else had left. He wanted to have his ashes spread on the shore of their cabin in northern Wisconsin. He left everything to his sons from his previous marriage that he hadn't seen in years and didn't even show up to his funeral. Of course that's not how it works. It was now my grandma's stuff point we left the funeral home together. My grandmother sat in the back with us holding his ashes. We got close to her home and came up on his favorite bar. My grandmother asked us to stop. She asked my dad for his pocket knife and he gave it to her. We pulled up, and she got out carrying the urn to the front door of the bar. As I watched her I remember, being confused about what she was going to do. She set the urn on the ground, opened it and pulled out the bag of ashes, cut it open with the knife, and poured his ashes in the container you put out cigarettes in. She picked up the urn, and got back into the car. She said loudly he spent all of our money here so that's where his ashes belong. We started driving away, and she said loudly his soul is in hell anyway. We were all quiet the rest of the ride. We dropped her off at her home, and gave hugs and kisses. 
I still remember the smile on her face as we drove away. She looked so happy. I'm a medical student. Two years ago, I had a young patient, on his 20s, that suffered from neurofibromatosis. He had developed brain tumors several times and received treatment. At that point, he had been really lucky, because despite the tumors affecting the CNS and the multiple surgeries he had undergone, he never had neurological deficit and even was on remission for some time. But, as he had neurofibromatosis, he developed a brain tumor again. Sadly, this time he also developed severe neurological deficit. He could hardly talk, he couldn't walk, and he had lost sensitivity in a great extent of his body. Unfortunately, this time the tumor was inoperable. He had to stop studying, which was what he liked the most. Even though he and his mom knew about the bad prognosis of his condition, he would always say he would go back to school after recovering. It was heartbreaking. I used to go and perform a complete physical exam, emphasizing on the CNS. One day, I went to perform the physical exam, as usual, but this time I found out he had recovered sensitivity on his face. The prior day, he had no sensitivity. It was incredible. His mom and him were so happy, and we could feel their happiness too. They still had hope, and saw the good things in their bad times. But it was also bittersweet, because we knew he wouldn't recover this time point this has been the most emotional experience I've had as a medical student. I felt happy, I felt sad, I felt empathy. And even though he passed away, I'll never forget him. I'm an RN at a skilled nursing facility. We had an elderly LTC resident in her 60s who had previously been homeless for years with severe paranoid schizophrenia. No family, friends, visitors at all. She minded her own booziness, stayed in her room, unless she went outside, to sit on the porch or the dining area for meals. She had some common conditions such as hypertension and heart disease. Well she would refuse all of her medications t.t believing we were poisoning her. She was perfectly pleasant, unless you invaded her space, housekeeping wasn't able to step foot into her room to clean it, because she would attack them point she also hadn't bathed or changed clothes in two years. When we would ask her if she wanted a shower she would say she had taken one at 3am or something, but it was beyond obvious she hadn't. She had smoke caked onto her face from where she would occasionally smoke. She smelled to high heaven, and I don't know if you have ever seen clothes that had been worn continuously for two years, but they were pretty worn out and stained. I remember she wore a wine red t-shirt and bluish fleece tweer tpj bottoms. She would get clothes donated on holidays, but would reject them, because she didn't want to owe anyone anything. We would try every day, to get her to shower, or change her clothes and she would refuse every time. Well, one day she said she would. On my shift. I was so damn happy I pulled the 8-4, that all told her she was to give her a spa level bath experience, and while she was doing that I snuck into her room, and grabbed those old clothes, and tossed them into a bag to be cleaned, would have thrown them away, but what if they belonged to someone important? I then drove to Walmart as fast as I possibly could, and bought her 3 sets of new PJ bottoms and t-shirts. When I got back to the facility she was cleaned, and was just so damn grateful, when I showed her what I had gotten her. I remember her saying thanks Christy this means a lot and hugged me. I was so damn proud I was telling everyone. I only work weekends so this all happened on Sunday and the next Saturday I came into work, to be told she had a massive heart attack, while taking a shower during the week at 3am all alone, and they didn't find her in time. I was so damn heartbroken. She was finally coming around, and making a positive change, but I guess life doesn't care about that. Too little, too late I guess. No family or friends to notify. Just thought I'd add one of my sad stories. I'm in psychiatry so for better or worse, I'm often used as a tool, to tell patients bad news, or at least be present when the news is given. This as if my mere presence will ameliorate the other doctor's horrible bedside manner. I have a few stories way back I had a young part who was anorexic. Part would be admitted, and eat just enough to get a BMI that was almost normal, and be discharged. In the process the part would piss off everyone, complain that everything was the hospital's fault, and had a caretaker who was loving, but obviously enabled the behavior the part would be hospitalized, refuse eating d slash o and slash out referral w caretaker's blessing, and be readmitted shortly after. 
This happened many times before I saw them. Speaking W the part and caretaker together, I said the part would most likely die before reaching adulthood, and with their history I was recommending hospice and palliative care as they continued to refuse treatment. I said something along the lines of, if you're not going to seek treatment for the root problem, we might as well make you comfortable. The hospitalizations has no point I said. I also told them I had to report to Childline that the part was not receiving treatment for a potentially fatal disease point caretaker was livid, said this is not new to us, part is hospitalized all the time, as if that made things better. I explained this made them desensitized and this was actually very serious. Caretaker also insisted that they knew the part the best, which is true. But I said, something has to change, so why not try treatment? They had religious reasons and would not compromise Childline dismisses the case and very quickly might I add. Caretaker filed a complaint against me w the hospital saying I was overreacting and unprofessional. I got notified that there would be a formal hearing for me for my conduct. The recommendation of hospice was seen as overreaching as a shrink. Short time later the kid died suddenly from a potassium imbalance after some purging. I was in the IQ on another consultation when I made eye contact with the caretaker. Caretaker refused to look at me and was obviously devastated. It wasn't a sort of bet I was happy to win obviously, but I'll admit I was pretty mad at that person and I tried to pursue eye contact longer than was polite my committee meeting was interesting. They eventually admitted the indications for hospice care that the kid met the requirements but said it should have come from the primary team. That was fair enough I suppose. When they asked me how I would deal w the kid next time, I was stunned. I calmly informed them that the kid was actually dead. It was a weird mixture of satisfaction, sadness and guilt that I felt. Nothing came of the meeting, except that one of the heads of the hospital apologized privately point I don't work there anymore. Nurse here point this is a sad story, as a warning point I'm a pediatric nurse in our float pool and go down to the Piku often. Level 1 trauma comes in 2 year old drowning in the family pool. Family thought it was the dog. Unknown time under, 5 to 20 minutes. Grandma did CPR on scene point part is stabilized, intubated, sedated, ECT per protocols. Do brain MRI after he's stable to determine outcome. Nothing to maybe very mild activity. Parents want to wait, do another next week, see if he's looking better. Agree. Wait. It's worse. Parents want to wait one more. Agree. Wait. Same to worse point majors care conferences. Talk about withdrawing care, donating organs, etc. Parents are convinced he's alive. Think reflexes are him moving. Ask if they can take him home like this. So he can get better at home. Again explain, he's not going to get better. Parents get aggressive. Demand to take him home. Explain he will have to be tratched slash duty. Parents agree. Doctors sigh and do it point parents ask about car seat for ride home. Explain to parents kid is now wheelchair bound. They will have to get a WC van. Parents are currently saving for new house. Explain house will have to be WCA accessible point decide to send kid. To long term medical facility until they can prepare everything for him to come home. Parents excited to send kid there as they go on a lot of field trips to the zoo and parks. Don't have it in me to explain to parents their kid won't be going on those trips. Parents left hospital believing kid will get better TLDR 2 year old dies from drowning. Parents refuse to believe it. Keep kid alive. First week of intern year feels like 600 years ago, but it was just earlier this month point I had the honor of starting my medical career in the IQ of a big medical center that sees a lot of major trauma and high acuity sheet. I had to tell a big family that their dad, 50 meters, broke his neck after he flipped his ATV, bled into his spinal cord and brainstem, stopped breathing for 20 minutes, and now his brain is pretty much a completely dead edematous pile of garbage. And it was faking terrifying for me. This lady, the wife, was so amazingly supportive to me throughout this whole process of taking care of the guy. Point we finished his cooling protocol early in the morning, so all we had to do is reassess him and see if there is any function or any hope. That may be the CPR that started after he was found down with a broken neck, might have saved some of his brain. Well, this guy got kind of lucky because his neck was broken. 
Normally, around this time, the body goes into myoclonic jerking. They just involuntarily jerk around as the inflamed brain tissue sends out random signals to do so. But this guy broke his neck at C1 and C2, so was legit paralyzed, so he was way more peaceful, just chilling there. And all throughout that day every time the wife would see me, or catch me getting reamed by the attending physicians she would check, and make sure I was okay, and tell my bosses, what a rough day I was having, and that they should be nice to me point what an amazing person she is. Not my experience, but I watched it happen and it still hurts. To think about point in pharmacy school I had an ed rotation at a children's hospital and a 3 year old arrived by helicopter after having a large tube TV fall on him. He was climbing the dresser and the it tipped over and landed on top of him. Couldn't bring myself to follow up and find out the cause of death, but I'm guessing internal bleeding based on how much blood was cleared from his mouth slash airway. Resuscitation efforts went on for close to an hour. Mother has been standing off to the side the whole time watching, and finally the physician leading the code outlines the situation, and asks if anyone in the room objects to ceasing resuscitation efforts. Nobody did so the doctor went over to the mother, pretty much 2-3 two to three steps away, explained the situation, and told her that her 3 year old boy had passed. At that moment, everyone stopped and kind of took a step back from the child. The mother cried out, and went over to the bedside. It still hurts to think about because the pain in her voice was so great point she was calling him by a nickname that only a mother would give to her son and just kept begging for him to come back. Over and over she was saying, please, don't leave me. Please, come back. Honestly, it's probably the most heartbreaking moment I have ever witnessed. I never want to experience anything like that again. Watching someone's life truly fall apart in an instant is something I can't deal with. My daughter was only 2 when I was diagnosed with B-cell lymphoma 4 tumors close to my spine. My father was with me at the hospital when I walked out and he asked me what they said. I responded let's sit down. When I told him I had cancer, the look on his face I'll never forget. He was always there for me and there was nothing he could do. He looked so scared and helpless at the same time. I've never seen him look like that. I told him it's okay. I promise him I'll beat it. Point one tumor pushed a bunch of nerves up against my spine. I lost the use of my left leg completely. Doctors told me I would never walk again, and after surgery there's 85-90% chance of being paralyzed from the waist down. Point surgeon was only supposed to take a sample of a tumor, but he got too close to my spine, attempting to relieve pain, and rip the membrane around my spine. He didn't repair it properly. For the next few months, while doing radiation and chemotherapy, I was living with intense pain in my head. Come to find out my spinal fluid was leaking. My brain dried out, swelled up and was bleeding. Surgery for proper repair finds three serious infections from spinal fluid. Get spinal tap while healing. Pick line into my heart. Carry I for six weeks with antibiotics. While on chemo every little smell makes me sick. Plus I can't walk. Try to play with my daughter, but constantly getting sick. Everything about it a terrible experience, but I keep my promise to my dad, and beat it point lots of people come out of these experiences with a better outlook on life. Not me. The exact opposite tbh. Get addicted to the painkillers. Start doing other drugs. No longer the optimist I used to be. No longer have a will to live. Extremely depressed. Hit rock bottom. Start straightening out my life. My father moves into my house. He complains a few times about just pains, never brought him to the hospital. One night a few months ago, we are drinking, arguing. I say some hurtful truths regarding past that shouldn't have been said. Go to bed. Next day after work I buy supper on the way home. Knock on his bedroom door, no answer. Open his door and find him on his floor, stiff and blue. Cry with his head in my hands until the undertakers come and get him point more so depressed. Don't leave his room for weeks with bottles upon bottles of rum. Crying. He was my best friend. And the last thing I said to him was that he was a loser and to grow up. I love you dad and I miss you. Niku nurse here. We had a preemie born around 26 weeks. Now around 30 weeks. Slowly change from completely stable grower feeder to barely clinging to life in a matter of about 16 hours. 
it was sepsis, but we didn't find out until too late. I don't remember details, but the parents had fertility issues and were overjoyed about finally having the baby they longed for. The family was surprised slash confused when we told them things were not going well at around 8pm, in shock slash terrified when I called them around 6am to tell them we coded him and got him back, but I think they should come in as soon as possible, I was hoping for them to see him alive one last time. They arrived at 6.30 shortly, after we started losing him again, I ran out to usher them in the back door, feeling like someone else was telling them in a calm voice you're going to see a lot of people around his bed, we are doing all we can for him, but he's very sick, and not responding well, but they stared at me in silent wide-eyed shock point, just before they reached his bedside the neonatologist whisked them into a side room, I kept walking onto the bedside, to continue helping with the code. A few seconds later I heard his mother's soul shattering, gut-wrenching wail point it hit us hard. All of us immediately began sobbing, still compressing slash bagging slash flushing, because we hadn't officially been told to stop yet. By far the worst one. Not quite sure this is what you're looking for, since I'm not a doctor. I was actually in the other side of the conversation. Here's my take. For what it's worth point my older half brother was diagnosed with a pretty violent lung condition early 2010. From early on he was going in and out of hospitals, and a transplant was basically the only cure point as it turns out, the disease decided not to wait for it. By the end of the year, during one of the hospital spells, his breathing got really bad. He was taken to the IQ, he was conscious the first few days, but soon had to be knocked out so the mechanical breathing machine, whatever it's called, could be used point a couple weeks later, he passed away. Even though our father was still alive, their relationship had some serious issues. Me and him, however, were really close, so, even though I was 7 years his junior, he had put me down as his emergency contact in the IQ point I got called late at night, around 22pm, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, to go down to the hospital, as the doctors needed to talk to me. A nice nurse took me to a small room, where a nice doctor told me one of the big blisters in my brother's lungs had collapsed, and he didn't resist it. I thanked him for his kindness, and asked what I should do next. I don't think I had ever been so cold, or have been ever since. I took the news, as if someone was telling me my flight got cancelled, and I had to make arrangements for the night point the first person I called was my dad, and he collapsed on the floor crying, I knew he would. For me, it took a good number of hours in calls, and notifying the closest people, and handling the immediate bureaucracy, before I was able to feel the hit. No idea if this was particularly cold or distant, but I just felt like I needed to take care of things before I could hurt. Always struck me as being particularly cold, but then again, I don't have other experiences to compare this to. That's it. I miss you, big brother. <coughs> Nursing assistant here. I'm often the one who sits with dying people when nobody else is there. What strikes me the most about death in a hospital is not family reactions, but how often nobody shows up. I can't count the number of patients who would have died alone if a staff member hadn't sat in there holding their hand while they passed. Also common for people to be in the hospital for weeks or months, no visitors. To me, that's worse than any bad reaction. But since I'm sure you all want a story, I will tell you what happened when my dad died last spring. He had end stage liver disease from cirrhosis, he was an alcoholic. I understood what this meant, and I understood what was happening when he got intubated then got pneumonia, but my family didn't. This process took about two weeks of declining health in the IQ. My brother, thankfully, trusted my judgment and was on the same page as me about eventually making him DNR. He was way too far gone, very sick and coding him would have been cruel, but other family members were not. By the time he was truly brain dead, this is what was happening, aunt hash one, swore she would not let him die, until he woke up, and had one more chance, to accept Jesus as his personal savior. My dad was Christian, but not my aunt's particular flavor of Christian, she thought this meant he was damned to hell. Uncle, literally no reaction other, than should I get my liver checked out? Aunt hash two, was completely unable to accept, that he was dying slash dead. Several hours after we took him off the ventilator, 
his heart rate spiked, trying to compensate for his low oxygen due to respiratory failure, and she thought that his meant he was coming back to life. I had to explain to her at least a dozen times that he wasn't coming back, no matter what we did. This was extra hard because I was the one who ultimately pushed everybody to make the decision for comfort care based on his condition. It felt like I had to convince them to kill my dad over and over again. For months, I wasn't able to go back to work and risk having to watch people die. During my first rotation as a PM and R resident, we had a male in his mid-40s admitted to might be unit. He was involved in a motorcycle, W helmet, collision with a tractor trailer. His second wife, also helmeted, that was riding with him didn't survive. He was in the hospital for 1-2 to two weeks then he was transferred to us for a hab. He had a severe traumatic brain injury with post-traumatic amnesia. This means he can't RM our new events or facts. Every day he would ask me when he can go home so he can ride his motorcycle with his second wife and why she wasn't around or visiting him. It was gut-wrenching to have to evade the topic or lie to him every day. I had to do this nearly two times a day for nearly four to five weeks. We it's necessary to do this because he wouldn't remember everything we would tell him, so we spare him the daily emotional trauma. Once he was out of post-traumatic amnesia, we called for a family meeting with his parents and ex-wife. We requested his daughters to stay at home for obvious reasons. When we told him what had happened, it was like he saw a ghost. He was with us for an additional week afterwards and was emotionless. A stark difference from his cheery, joking self previously. My daily rounds with him consisted of him saying yes slash no with zero emotion point he continued his follow up with us and the neuropsychology team, he did a lot better, made significant physical and mental recovery, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think gave up riding a motorcycle, thankfully. Another re-empty here. A few years ago I was called to the scene of a construction accident. I honestly heard it wrong over the radio as a difficulty breathing wasn't prepared to roll up. It's rare that things catch me off guard point the first tip off was the cop waving us onto the scene with no trial gloves on. And then we pulled up to a 20 year old male, really really dead point there are different stages of dead in the field I think, there's dead like they look, like they are sleeping, there's dead dead where there is rigor, and then there is shrieking dead where without a shadow of a doubt it is something you'll always remember. This young man was in a river of his own blood. They had been laying cement, and using an improper chain. To hold up the next slab. In the hole that was created to house the new concrete sidewalk was a dolly, and this young man leaned into the hole to retrieve it. The problem was that the slab itself was subtly swinging, and as it was a bit of a ragtag operation, it swung into his unhelmeted head and ripped half of his face off. He died on impact, and from what I walked up to it was good he did. I could see into his skull, into his brain and his skin on his face literally peeled back like something out of Mission Impossible. His eye was subtly hanging out, and his hair was still stuck to the iron slab point we covered his body with a sheet that quickly turned red after the medics came to pronounce and waited for the family to arrive. They only spoke Spanish, so they asked me to stay with the cop to tell the news. I'll never forget their faces. She started telling them there was an accident, and they just nodded, and then she explained he was struck in the head and the two young men she was telling just yelled S C Rio, and dropped to their knees and yelled. I've seldom seen grown men a shell of themselves. I handed them his wallet and there was a picture of a young girl in it. To this day I think about him, her and that family. I don't know if she was a niece or his daughter, but I hope she is doing okay. During my M3 gin oncology rotation, I took part in a surgery for a mid-30s woman that had been putting off treatment for nearly a year, even though the doc I was working with had told her over and over that she was afraid that her symptoms were indicative of cancer. The thing is, the patient and her husband were insistent that she get to keep her ovaries, which the doc thought were likely already involved in the cancer spreading from her uterus. They were planning for another child at the time. The husband was so worried about this that they sent a nurse back twice to make sure her wishes were followed and wanted photos of the path samples we sent frozen samples to get preliminary path results that came back while she was still on the table to evaluate whether we could even consider leaving her ovaries but they returned a very rare high grade type of endometrial tumor. 
My job as the student was to take the sample photos on the path department camera. I'll never forget what the doc said when I asked her how I should get the photos to them. I'm not going to make her look at pictures of what will kill her in a year. It was like watching this woman who has maybe 10 years on me become a corpse on the ore table. I wasn't there for the talk about the findings, but I thought that the patient's initial reaction to the possibility of having cancer was frustratingly relatable, just putting off finding out whatever outcome and choosing to focus so hard on regular things, like having another kid. I once battled to keep a woman's oxygen levels up with a bad lung condition throughout a whole night shift. Things weren't going well, and the family was called in to be with her. It became apparent that she was deteriorating despite all the therapy that we could give her within pre-greed limitations. While I was still in the early phases of the shift and I wasn't sure what was going to happen I said to her that I would do my best to look after her, whatever that meant. She said knew she was very unwell with an ultimately terminal condition. She looked at me, smiled and squeezed my hand point later, when it was clear nothing was working, her disease was too advanced to try intubation and ventilation, she was moved to a private room from the open high dependency room. She was very close to the end of her life. Her family all knew what was going to happen. I even talked them through what it would look like, breathing slowing down gradually before eventually on breath being her last. When it finally happened the tenor, so relatives had a very varied response. The one that struck me most was her middle-aged daughter shouting at her to breath. Most were still in shock. Others cried. Pretty typical responses to a loved one dying point the other thing that's common is wailing and screaming in grief. More common in cultures from Africa, South Asia and the Caribbean in my experience. These days I'm an emergency physician. I'm quite hardened to death. I was even then, but her death affected me more than most, probably because I'd spent hours looking after her, and probably shared her final words. I hid in the kitchen, and cried for a good half hour until the cook found me, and made me tea. Hey, it's England. It's not just the patients and families that deaths affect. I'm a vet tech at a general practice animal hospital. Last week we had an old boxer brought in for euthanasia. We hadn't seen the dog for the past two years, and the female of the couple confirmed that the dog hadn't been seen anywhere in that interval. Woman sat on the couch in our comfort room. Man sat on the armchair. Woman is flippant and brusque throughout appointment. Man is red-faced, looking at the floor or the dog. Woman says oh, this is his dog, not mine. My poor baby doctor runs through the litany of stuff we could possibly do to reduce pain for the dog, and the man just sits there, and the woman says, more than once, no we just want this over, and done with, so we can get out of here. Man is getting more and more upset, and woman is just stone faced cold and brusque with us. We take the dog out, to put in the fourth catheter for the euthanasia drugs. Dog isn't so out of it, that she doesn't try to watch us shave, and put the catheter in. We take the dog back in. Doctor has me wait outside the room. She comes back out barely two minutes later, and the room is now empty bar the dead dog on the floor. Doctor is trashed, but we have our next room to go into, which is whatever it was, not another euthanasia, TG. That room finished, she looks at me and asks if I thought she had handled it well, had she pushed anything on them, etc. I told her that she had been great, that she'd offered palliative care things we could have done to help them have more time with the dog, while not extending the dog's pain, and the dog was painful, no doubt about it, but that in my view, what it came down to was that doctor had provided mercy for that dog, since the owners did not want to give her any pain meds, nor do anything else to help her get around more easily. And that yes, the woman in the room was a huge beach, and if she was tired of taking care of the dog, and caregiver fatigue is real, I know that, she could at least have been more sympathetic to the man, who was obviously losing a pet near, and dear to his heart. She treated him like an unsympathetic sister tired of his sheet, rather than a supposedly loving spouse. For me, that was the most upsetting euthanasia I've had to help with. Putting a dog down, when it's at the end of its life, and in pain, and is just old and worn out, or ill and worn out, this doesn't really bother me. And if somebody's money has run out, and they cannot afford further treatment, I don't like it, but I understand. To be so cold about it was just incomprehensible to me. 
had a patient in the IQ while in residency who had end-stage COPD on 6L home oxygen 24 over 7 and continues to smoke, gets admitted on BPAP or tubed, usually with minimal sedation too, about once a month. The IQ staff was very familiar with her, we all knew she couldn't maintain this life much longer. She gets admitted, and we can't extubate her, because she keeps retaining CO2 and remains hypoxemic, so after weeks of discussion, the family finally agrees to a potential terminal extubation and transition to comfort care. I was on call that night, and love it or hate it, she was one of those patients, where once you pump enough morphine, and burst into her, her minute ventilation and global oxygen demand drop so much, that she actually survives for 3 more days on just nasal cannula point on the last day, her family was, so distraught over her laying in bed, mouth agape, comatose, with a regular shallow bradypnea breathing, they were starting to lose it. On morning rounds, the patient's adult son, around 40 yo, had broken down into tears begging us to just kill her already. He kept suggesting ideas, like giving her a medication to stop her heart, or turning up the morphine so much that it directly kills her. The rest of the family broke down too, and started begging us, and begging the unconscious patient to just die. It felt like at the end of the Tim and Eric billion dollar movie, when they are pleading with Taquito to just die already. My attending appropriately directly confronted the requests and told him I understand where you're coming from and if we were in a different state or country, we could potentially stop her heart like that, but we'll just let her soak up all of this comfort for as long as she wants. She's earned it point after more talk, we took her nasal cannula off and doubled her morphine and before finishing rounds, she had passed. I'm a resident physician. One experience in particular comes to mind point there was a patient, mid 40s, listed for an organ transplant, and was status 1A, signifying the highest urgency of need. The patient had a spouse and children. Despite the tenuousness of the patient's health, this person was able to interact with family and the staff, and, tethered to equipment, that continuously delivered life-sustaining therapy, could even manage a feeble, but good-natured walk around the nursing unit. Warm and gracious, the patient kept a sense of humor despite devastating illness, earning the admiration of all the staff. Point the call came, a suitable donor organ had become available. The procurement team flew to the hospital housing the donor, harvested the organ, and flew back with a cooler full of hope. In our hospital, the patient was prepped for surgery and wished sweet dreams by the anesthesiologist. Out with the old, and in with the new. The surgery was flawless. The patient was wheeled to the IQ. Vital signs were initially reassuring. Then the blood pressure started to dip. Intravenous fluids were given. Powerful medications were administered. Imaging and laboratory tests failed to elucidate the cause. Nothing was working. Then he had no pulse. An immediate and massive resuscitation effort began. More than a dozen physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists and pharmacists lent their expertise and their muscle. Nothing was working. The cardiothoracic surgeon was called to institute complete heart-lung bypass. For more than an hour and a half medical personnel tried heroically, futilely, to bring this wonderful spouse, this fantastic parent, this unique and irreplaceable person back from the dead, before the intensivist gave a final pronouncement. The nurses were devastated, the physicians, shattered. Then came the family point I'll never forget it. After the team cleaned the room and restored some semblance of peace to the body and countenance of the patient, the patient's spouse and one of their children approached the last door separating them from their loved one point the child said, I don't think I can go in there, and tried to back away. Her sole surviving parent ushered her through the door and had just began to shut it when the child let loose a full-throated soul-wrenching wail. Her mother cried with her, and for 30 minutes shouted at the universe for the sheety, sheety lot they'd all been dealt point most of the staff members were crying too, but they couldn't stop to grieve. They cried while they tended both to this broken family, and to the patients and their own worried loved ones in neighboring rooms. Okay, not a doctor, or even a nurse, but I used to work as a nurse's assistant. While we were doing clinicals one of my patients was actively dying. It wasn't a surprise, she'd been dying for a long while. The staff and family all knew it was happening. She had stopped eating many days prior, and drinking a few days before. Today she had the death rattle as my nurse teacher was telling me. 
for some reason, they selected me to be the person to care for her that day out of all the students. And the family knew I was learning and that death would be part of the process. I was so overwhelmed and nervous and heartbroken. I've never been around death. All my grandparents and even great grandma was still alive. I was so weirded out that this was just it. We were just waiting for it and not trying to stop it from happening. Just caring for her, wetting her lips with a cotton swab, and keeping her as comfortable as possible. Since this has apparently been a long process, the family had gone they had been there many days leading up to this, but they all had work to get back to, and lives to get back to. Today we called them, and said we thought it would be soon. The daughter shows up, and seems distraught understandably. I tell her the things I've learned to try and comfort her, that she is comfortable, and we are taking care of her. Her daughter just looks at me, and goes no I just wish she picked a better day. It's the 6th of June 2006. This was back in 2006. It's an unholy day to die. I can't believe she couldn't wait a day. With a sound of disgust in her voice. I was so confused I hadn't even thought about the date. I wasn't sure why that would be her biggest worry the day her mother dies. But I understand she was probably in shock. Her mother did pass peacefully a couple hours thereafter. The family did not want to be in the room for it, so they waited in the hall. This one doesn't quite fit the bill of your question, because I'm not a doctor, and it was the patient themselves that the nurse told would be dying. But it's pretty close to the question point I was visiting my grandma in the hospital a bit over a year ago, she's pretty much fine now, but keeps having to go back but that's beside the point, and was in a large shared room. There were four beds, but only two occupied, including my grandma. The other one was a woman of about 80, similar to grandma, who would sleep 50% of the time, and talk for 30%, and pretend to vomit for the other 20%. One day when I was visiting a nurse came in, and began speaking to the other patient. We obviously weren't listening, but could still hear her. Here's a rough quote of what the nurse said to the other lady, I'm sorry but you're tumor, or something, is inoperable. You have about 6 months to live, and left. Just like that. I went over to comfort the woman, but she wanted to be left alone. Broke my heart to see someone so callously informed, that they were going to die. Breaks my heart even more, now that I think about it knowing, that she's dead now point pretty much all nurses I've encountered in my various grandma related hospital visits have been awful. They are for the most part, very cold and beachy. I always hear them in the halls discussing patients. I always give them death stares to make sure they know I'm judging them. I know serious answers are required but a friend who is a nurse, now in Australia, told me once of how news can go the other way. Parents were called to a and e because their son had been involved in a serious car accident. They turned up all stressed out and were taken off to see him. The dad refused as he didn't want, except his son was dead. Oh, he isn't dead, it just that he's handcuffed to the bed in there, and the police would like to speak to you. Numpty and friends had stolen a car, and crashed point anguish turned to relief, and then to embarrassment, then to anger however, knowing that your unborn child may not make it to full term is a kick in the guts our second child was diagnosed in utero with supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, and later the added bonus of Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, WPW. Separately they are not that deadly, together they are a perfect storm. My wife took flaconide which passes through the placenta and reduced her heart rate. She was also developing hydrops fetalis and showing signs of heart failure. She had further episodes of SVT at 6 and 8 weeks respectively, which resulted in adenosine being given to reset her heart, initially given digoxin and then atenolol to keep her heart behaving. Atenolol can also be used to, to treat anxiety, and when they withdrew it as it was just a therapeutic dose, we discovered she was autistic, the drugs masked her meltdowns. She also has hypermobile joints, low muscle tone, dyspraxia and developmental coordination disorder, DCD. At 12 she had catheter ablation, to fix the SVT and WPW, which so far, has been a success, when I think back to the emotions we suffered with soon hearing the news years ago, and what every diagnosis along the way, has meant to us. Life is a roller coaster you just have to ride it. 
Almost a year ago my aunt died from sepsis caused by negligence point she had been very sick for a long time, at death's door a few times, but always made it through, when she did die, of causes completely unrelated to, that which had caused her so much suffering, heart disease, it still came as a shock when someone has evaded death as many times as she did, you start to expect them to pull through. No matter what. I remember coming home in a pretty good mood, I opened the front door, and hear my mother and cousin sobbing I asked what happened, and my cousin or my mother, you'd think I'd remember it, but I was in complete and utter shock all week, and as a result barely remember anything beyond the initial news, delivered the bad news to me point for the next couple of minutes I just ran around muttering no. It can't be, while cursing myself for not feeling anything. Then it all hits me, and I fall to the floor for a whole month I was extremely pissed off and an utter as to people, because she was such a great person and life is just unfair. Also my uncle has been through so much already, and has now lost the love of his life as well. Sad and just felt, like I was in a fog I tend to lash out when in intense grief, and I thank those around me for being so understanding. My uncle finally found some happiness and life just takes it away far too early they were actually planning to finally tie the knot this year. After having lived together for over a decade point she was the kindest coolest aunt one could ask for and now she's gone it's difficult to think of her as dead. And I can't stop beating myself up over not visiting her when I had the chance a couple of weeks earlier thinking there would be another time and I don't think I ever will. My fondest memory of her is us perusing her record collection, putting on the first B-52s album she got as a young woman in London in the late 70s at the height of punk and new wave, just digging the grooves she had a great sense of humor, and never lost her sense of humor I never heard her curse, or complain about the sheety hand she had been dealt point sorry for the long post. I just felt glad to be able to share this with others in some way, it helps me process what had happened. I'm not a doctor, but I think it would still fit. Basically cancer is a beach. I've lost two grandparents to it, and I'm going to lose a third now point I don't remember much about my grandpa dying, other than I believe it was from lung cancer. I was in middle school at the time. My mom let me have the rest of the day at school like normal, before picking me up, and telling me point four, as long as I could remember, my grandma had cancer. It was incurable, and she would die from it at some point. She was originally told she had months, and lived way longer than that. Well one day after Thanksgiving, she fell sick, and was in the hospital. She was in a coma and her fever wouldn't come down. She was transported to a bigger hospital several hours away where she ultimately died. During this time, I never went to see her, which sounds cold, but I wanted to remember her laughing, not covered in tubes. My mom understood, and never pushed it. When she did pass, I cried but it didn't bother me that bad, because I knew it would happen at some point, I had grown up prepared for it, I was in high school at this point, just this year we found out that my other grandma has cancer now. They originally thought they could get rid of it and operated, but they didn't see just how far it had progressed. No one thought to ask the doctors at the time how long she had, well I found out sitting in a parking lot with my mom when my dad called. My mom has an annoying habit of putting the phone on speaker in the car. Let me tell you, hearing your dad say she only has months completely out of the blue, when you aren't even supposed to be hearing the conversation is horrible. 